hear me at the back. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, thank you to, to Matt for uh, inviting uh, me up here. Uh, you can tell I've come from Melbourne. I'm appropriately overdressed in dark colours. Uh, and um, uh, Matt's invited me up here as a sort of a token political scientist. So I hope you'll uh, forgive me if I sort of uh, uh, speak in, in, the, in the idioms and, and uh, some of the assumptions about the debates that animate uh, my particular uh, discipline. Um, Matt said it's fine to be a political scientist, that's okay, uh, and, and I suppose my response would be a bit like Martin Luther's, you know, here I stand, I can do no other. So um, uh, please feel free to, to ask any questions at the end if I'm not being uh, particularly um, uh, open or uh, explaining sufficiently about uh, the concepts that I'm uh, talking about. We'll also try and keep it uh, brief because I know we're running a little bit behind time. So. Um, my basic argument is going to be this, that um, although it's often portrayed as a, a populist and protectionist revolt against neoliberal globalisation, you know, it's sort of seen as part of that moment in 2016 where, where things seemed to turn against the, the international order we'd all got used to uh, in, uh, since the end of the Cold War, and in fact it facilitates the kind of free trade agreements that are the broader topic of this particular uh, afternoon's um, debate, uh, Brexit um, uh, was also driven by an elite project to expose the UK not to less globalisation, but actually to more globalisation. Right? So, so there are two counter currents within the, the vote to get Britain to leave the European Union that actually pull against each other. We'll find politically that they start to pull uh, against each other. And this took the form of um, uh, a very deep set and, and in fact quite long-standing uh, belief uh, amongst uh, what I'm calling elite Brexiteers, that's particularly those within the Conservative Party, but also um, uh, the leadership of something called the UK Independence Party. Um, uh, in, uh, with free trade agreements with other, and particularly Anglophone economies. So the idea was is that, um, you know, everyone speaks the language of trade, but English-speaking countries speak it uh, with a better accent, right? So the idea is, is that, um, English-speaking economies knew the correct relationship between states and markets, um, which particularly EU economies did not. Right? So this was the idea that was animating these um, uh, elite uh, Brexiteers. So what we see is that actually Brexit becomes a kind of a contest between two um, uh, what should be complementary but actually competing understandings of free trade. Right? So there's a kind of a hyper-globalist Anglosphere version of free trade as opposed to um, a kind of a more... Um, auto liberal um, EU understanding of free trade because the, the EU is of course very committed to free trade agreements as we know this is why we're here Australia should have one with the EU by the end of 2019 although I have been hearing a lot about this in my time uh, in Australia so uh, let's see what we get and this leads me then to the, the risk the greatest risk to the Australia EU FTA posed by Brexit is that of a politicization of the process via two countervailing tendencies. The first, Brexit and the kind of hyper-globalisation of the elite Brexiteers who are pushing the British government uh, at the moment from the margins of the Conservative Party, uh, and also the protectionist turn, which is embodied most obviously by President Trump. Right? And, and so if anyone was following uh, Trump, you know, it's very easy to follow him via Twitter, isn't it? But, you know, he goes and leaves this sort of scatological uh, Twitter uh, detritus behind him. Uh, and you'll notice that he was in England. He, went, uh, he met with the British government, not before almost completely undermining their Brexit strategy for leaving. Right? So um, uh, I'll, I'll, I can come to, to this uh, a bit later on. Right? So um, now... Brexit, of course, um, if you're catastrophically minded, um, represents a very uh, important moment uh, in the history of European integration. We know that Europe has been deepening and broadening. It's, it's been expanding from its original uh, six member states uh, in 1957 up to 28, soon to be 27. Uh, member states, and that's important because the process of European integration is in some areas at least going into reverse. And so we now have to sort of think in terms of not just European integration, uh, but European disintegration. And this is where scholars in, in my field, in, in initially it was international relations and now it's political science, have been asking themselves for a long time what is driving this. And Brexit has challenged this. In fact, uh, 
Christian Lekesner has described Brexit as an epistemic breach in terms of how we understand the process of European integration. And the conclusion that Brexit gives us um, in terms of how theory and um, uh, reality interrelate is that domestic politics matter. Now, for those of you outside the discipline, that might seem like a bleeding obvious and really underwhelming conclusion to reach, right? Um, however, if you were mired in the discipline and the debates about it, it's actually quite mind-blowing because European integration was seen to be driven by um, events above and beyond domestic politics. It was a depoliticized realm that was driven by experts and technocrats for the greater good. And particularly after the Cold War, it became allied with this idea of um, liberalism, uh, uh, which morphed into a kind of a neoliberalism and which started to consume, you know, like, like Saturn consuming uh, his sons. Um, uh, this was uh, a way that, a particular way of understanding the world and the economy, liberalism, morphed into neoliberalism, which eventually became a critique of the thing that was established to um, facilitate it, the European Union. Okay, now, of course, from the Australian perspective, there's always a critique of um, uh, the European Union, which is not about liberalism, it's about protectionism and external tariffs, and so the view from outside of Europe looks quite different. But uh, in terms of the immediate um, way of understanding this, Brexit becomes important, and that conclusion that domestic politics matter uh, will be significant when we return to our conclusions uh, at the end. All right, so just to reinforce this point that Brexit contains two possibly competing elements. So when I say Brexit, I should say support for Britain leaving the EU in 2016, refracted through the device of a referendum, <coughs> contained two uh, competing elements. The first was uh, what you might call a kind of a protectionist, a nativist. Um, we sometimes use the term uh, populist, um, though people are beginning to, to problematize that uh, idea, um, uh, was the idea that there was a revolt brewing amongst sections of the British electorate, particularly those who were the so-called left behind uh, by the benefits of globalization. That is to say the less educated and those in lower socioeconomic uh, groups, um, and particularly it was seen at the time white working class men. Right? The mo if, if you knew any white working class men in their 50s, you could pretty much guarantee that they would be opposed to Britain being in the EU. Uh, conversely, if you knew a Scottish woman in her 20s, uh, you would be pretty much guaranteed that she would want to stay in the EU uh, because we could figure out the voting preferences based on these uh, particular uh, socioeconomic groups. Um, the referendum victory was not just about this, though. This was a kind of a revolt that had been brewing for some years beforehand, and it was given expression in the 2014 elections to the European Parliament. But it's not the whole story. Uh, Four million people voted for the United Kingdom Independence Party, which was explicitly about getting the Britain out of the EU uh, in uh, 2015 uh, general election. Uh, and yet 17 million people voted to, to leave the European Union the following year. So there's a big gap there in terms of uh, the electorate that needs uh, explaining. And that becomes because there's a kind of a, I beg your pardon, a sort of an unwitting, if you like, alliance between these people that we might call the left behinds uh, and hyper-globalist elites committed to free trade, right? So, so we've got these two uh, different constituencies. Um, and what happens once the referendum itself is won is that the, the kind of the resentful electorate uh, is very much marginalised by the political process, which has become subsequently uh, a battle between those uh, soft and hard Brexiteers within the Conservative Party. UKIP itself collapsed at the e election last year, uh, and really its, its ghost remains in Conservative polit uh, politics, but as, as an electoral force, uh, it's on the ropes. So uh, what's the relationship between uh, Brexit and free trade? Here is uh, the former con uh, chairman of the Conservative Party, Grant Shapps, trying to come to terms with this. Uh, he, Grant Shapps, was not in favour of leaving the European Union. Um, uh, but in order to come to terms with the result, on, this is him speaking on the morning uh, after uh, Brexit uh, came about, um, he said, as an island, we need to rediscover, rediscover that swashbuckling spirit of the 19th century when we practically owned the concept of free trade. 
Right? Yes, we may have voted to leave the EU's political project, but now is not the time to turn inwards. This is, this is not uh, uh, an instance of parochial protectionism. In fact, very quickly it switches into, uh, into something else. Um, and, and this is, the, in some ways, is the origin of the idea of what gets called global Britain now. Right? Global, global Britain. So, it's not just a post facto rationalization of the, or at least a new reality. There are never, never usually just one reality in politics. It's part of a wider ideological project based on a long standing political tradition. There's nothing especially new about this either. Although Brexit itself is a major rupture, its roots uh, are located within political traditions uh, of the United Kingdom. And this was uh, simply, uh, if you like, a sense that the European Union really held Britain back. Right? The, the, in, in, on, on the right of British politics, not just the right of British politics, but on, particularly on the right of British politics, was a sense that, there was, that the European Union was um, um, dragging Britain down uh, under the waters like galley slaves chained on deck. Right? It was one quote, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a particular uh, member of parliament. And then we start to see in the early part of this decade this notion um, uh, of uh, if Britain could actually just throw off these shackles, they weren't named sometimes, but if we could throw off these shackles and adopt proper free trade, not the EU's kind of free trade, uh, then uh, things would be better for uh, Britain. Um, those of you who, uh, this book was uh, written in 2012 and it was a manifesto for free trade. You might notice that this person, Dominic Raab, Although I suspect you're not, don't expect you to watch that closely, but he's now the minister for Brexit. Okay, so he took over from, um, uh, and one of the people who took over uh, when Boris Johnson and David Davis uh, resigned. Um, but here again is a quote from a very influential uh, politician, former treasurer of the United Kingdom, saying that that look, actually, what people, what business people especially don't understand is the primacy of politics. Okay, that actually. You know, business, uh, you know, business, the business community finds it hard to understand that politics trumps economics, right? particularly in the US, right? is what he's saying. And that is because um, part of the neoliberal way of looking at the world is that, that trade is, 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 not, is apolitical. Right, and that, that, it is, that it remains outside of the realm of political contestation. And we can see that the movements that came to fruition in 2016 are challenging that very idea. A, a political philosopher called Jan Zelonka calls this a counter-revolution. We're living through a moment of counter-revolution in terms of neoliberalism. This then comes to the idea that the note to drop the word Trump uh, in is a good point to, to talk about other uh, English-speaking uh, powers. And uh, one thing that the, that the um, the Brexit elites like to point to was this thing called the Anglosphere. Now, you'll be pleased to know, you may not know, but you'll be pleased to find out that you are in the Anglosphere. Um, uh, there is a certain sense in which, you know, this is an ideology that has developed uh, on the right uh, and um, of politics, and it comprises five core states, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Sometimes Singapore gets lobbed in there as well, sometimes India too, depending on what kind of free trade deal uh, the British government wants to do. Uh, it's, a very it's an unofficial ideology. It's something that um, went very rapidly from the margins of cons right-wing conservative politics into uh, the mainstream, given it's off the peg appeal in the policy vacuum that opened up in, uh, in June 2016. But it's, again, it's, it's been around before. The UK Independence Party, openly campaigned uh, with it uh, as part of its foreign policy agenda. And it builds on these ideas of a, of a kind of a commonality, a common understanding, right? That um, uh, a common understanding uh, of the way that, that uh, markets, politics, and more broadly culture work refracted through the English language. That the English language and the political developments of these particular countries give them a way of looking at the world, which means that things like free trade uh, agreements are easy to do. So you don't have to have any kind of human rights conditionality clauses with any of your, um, with any of your free trade agreements or, or, or awkward things like sustainability uh, clauses or anything like that. You can just cut to the chase. Everyone talks literally the same language, but also metaphorically as well, uh, and get on with proper uh, neoliberal free trade. Um, 
the problem is, of course, um, uh, twofold. One with the Anglosphere. One is that not everyone uh, who actually inhabits the Anglosphere thinks it's a good idea. Uh, and secondly, Trump. Again, America is like the outlier here, or all the rest of us are, depending on how you, how you look at it. Um, from Washington, all the rest of us uh, are. Uh, but the, there are different interests between these different countries that, that if you like, um, uh, overlay and, and cancel out some of the commonalities. Although the, the, the language is very much one of, of common values, and you can kind of go to the Australian government's white paper, uh, foreign policy white paper of last year, and find language about values and like-minded powers and so on. But sometimes the geographic and the interest realities cut against that. So there is this thing called Anglo-scepticism. If, if I want to, to take this term Euroscepticism and turn it round, the idea emanating from Britain that uh, we should do, you know, that the world is waiting to do free trade agreements with the United Kingdom, in some places like Australia and New Zealand, is, is actually true. Australia uh, was very quick to put its hand up for a, for a tree, free trade agreement with Britain once it comes out of the EU, if it comes out of the EU. Um, uh, but on the other hand, there is a, a whole set of thoughts across the political uh, spectrum that just says this is actually unrealistic and it's a kind of a right-wing fantasy and it's tinged with nostalgia. The whole, that notion, particularly that quote about, you know, the swashbuckling spirit of the 19th century drew a lot of attention to the imperial origins uh, of the United Kingdom's uh, uh, perspective uh, and how they, its government currently thinks uh, it's going to reconstitute its relations uh, post-EU. Uh, so one um, uh, public servant, very civil, uh, senior public servant said that leaving the European uh, customs union to strike free trade deals with countries outside the EU is like giving up a three-course meal for the promise of a packet of crisps. Right? So you can see that, there, that, that this is actually the, the push from the British uh, government is um, driven uh, by ideology and it's a free trade ideology. I mean, I don't say ideology in a pejorative term. There, there are always ideas that govern our actions. Um, but, but there is resistance to this idea that Britain uh, could come out of the EU uh, and uh, reconstitute the, the world to its uh, advantage, equaling, you know, even only equaling uh, that that it's currently got already. So two more slides to go. The point here, of course, is how does this impact on the free trade uh, agreement uh, between Australia uh, uh, and the EU? And to paraphrase Princess Diana, I mean, there are three people in this marriage. So, you know, you've got to think that as the UK comes out, it's going to have some sort of impact on the EU-Australia relationship. Oh, I mean, that's going to be the challenge for the Australian government and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and all the kind of allied uh, departments that will be negotiating various chapters of the, um, uh, of the free trade agreement is how to stop that divorce spilling over into their own relationship. Right, so um, two things. One, it made the whole um, uh, Brexit deal, resting as it does on, on free trade, may become politicised. And I've got a quote here from uh, a, a debate that happened last, uh, the week before last uh, in the House of Commons. This is from uh, a pro-Remain uh, MP, Anna Subri, who, was, who is critical of um, the government uh, the hard line that, that is being driven from the right of the, of the Conservative Party. And she was, she was saying that people had, MPs had admitted to her in private um, that Britain is going to be worse off when it leaves uh, the European Union. And she said in, in the chamber, members sitting on the government benches in private conversations know that to be the case. What they have said in those private conversations is that the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs will be worth it to regain our country's sovereignty. We'll tell that to the people who voted leave in my constituency. Nobody voted to be poorer and nobody voted to leave on the basis that somebody with a gold-plated pension and inherited wealth would take their jobs away from them. Right? So, so you can see that although that kind of resentful part of the electorate has been quite successfully at the moment sidelined in the Brexit negotiations, the issue has not gone away. And that may uh, um, uh, arise again to uh, complicate uh, the Brexit negotiations. And the secondly, uh, I think Australia must avoid looking too keen for a deal with the UK because, uh, well, I'll go into these uh, particular uh, reasons. Um, uh, 
well, let me just say, because as Anne-Marie Elijah uh, has pointed out, the EU runs on political will. Right? It's, it, uh, although it tends to try and depoliticize its politics by saying oh, it's just about trade or you know, the, the, you know, we've got a technocratic solution for this, it's actually, it runs on political will and that is something that the whole suite of crises that it's faced since the Eurozone crisis uh, have really uh, pointed out. The Australia um, has a dilemma posed by Britain leaving uh, the European Union. Uh, particularly these um, uh, investment figures will give you a sense that, you know, without the UK in it, the EU is kind of less attractive, right? So, um, in some senses, you know, where do you put your priorities? If you're a department, you know, every department has limited priorities, so where do they go? Uh, the Australian government has said, well, we're going to do the one with the EU first because it's a bit more certain. Um, you know, but there are a lot of people on the right of Australian politics who kind of like Brexit too. And they like it for the same ideological reasons that the right the British politics like it. And when you look at some of these figures, you sort of might think, well, actually, you know, um, you know maybe it is, it is worth pursuing a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom. So Lachlan Mackenzie has underscored that the risk is political uh, rather than technical, which builds on Anne-Marie's idea in her submission to the um, Australian Parliament inquiry on the F EU FTA last year. And Gonzalo Villata Puig uh, argues that without the UK, Australia and the EU may lose interest in each other. And those figures that I just quickly showed you from DFAT uh, give you a sense why. Um, Royman, uh, Alison Royman, Murray and Matera also argue that Australia must be pragmatic rather than nostalgic. But I think nostalgic is not quite the right term. Although Brexit looks like to have very sort of strong imperial or post-imperial neo-imperial connotations, it's not, it, it's not simply that. It's more about ideology. The, the nostalgia is part of the ideology uh, which suggests that Britain was great, the EU made it worse, uh, and, and Brexit can make it uh, great again. So with that trajectory in mind, um, uh, the point comes across that this is actually very much part of an elite project in which um, resentful political opinion was mobilized in order to bolster and give some kind of democratic um, force to the project to get Britain to leave the EU. Um, uh, but we mustn't sort of put it exactly in the, in the kind of the, the Trump, Marine, Le Pen basket of, of protectionism. It's different to that. It's actually a, a kind of a, a hyper-globalist, a, a kind of a re-emphasization of free trade. So, so what we're seeing is competing free trade agendas, uh, which may crowd, uh, crowd out uh, and complicate uh, the Australia-EU uh, relationship itself. I'll leave it at that uh, and hand over if anyone wants some questions, but I'll hand over to the chair. <laughs> and uh, various um, uh, resignations following mm -hmm. the white paper. Um, also, whether you think there will be a deal or no deal, or whether you think Theresa May will lead the Conservatives into the next election, just any sort of general. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I know these are quite a few questions, yeah, but just yeah. A, a, your general assessment of what you think will happen next. Okay, well, my, my, my general answer is can I provide predictions is no. Um, uh, well, I, I, was, I, I think uh, Marek said that, you know, that you know, we try and use the past to predict the future. It's a terrible guide to the future, but it's the best we've got. Um, uh, in, in terms of like, the way things are shaping up, well, we know that October um, is the deadline for the, for the negotiations to be concluded. And it has to be said we are getting quite close to that without um, some significant areas of agreement. Now, there have been some areas of agreement. Um, in terms of how much money Britain has to pay in order to get out uh, and what will happen to uh, the rights of um, EU citizens living in the UK and vice versa. But we know lots of EU citizens have been leaving the UK. Uh, we also know that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And so the, the sticking points, particularly over the border between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland in Northern Ireland, um, is really the hard uh, part. And we now know that, as they sh should have been doing for a long time, various government agencies in the United Kingdom are preparing for a no-deal 
which means Britain would crash out, which means short term there would be enormous amounts of disruption uh, and so on. Um, the, the negotiations would go on over the summer, but politically we're going into the summer recess, which is a terrific time for people to connive against their leaders. And because um, politics is not a nice uh, profession. And um, so I do sort of wonder, uh, the, the, there's a group called the European Reform Group, which consists of about 60 MPs in the Conservative Party, which is, is very militant and, and actually wants Britain to crash out. You know, they, it's almost like a kind of revolutionary defeatism. If, you know, the worse it gets, the quicker things will get better. Um, whether they have the numbers to mount a challenge, um, perhaps in September, Parliament shouldn't come back until October, uh, whether there'll be a, a challenge mounted before then, I mean, it's possible, but to be honest, British politics is so um, disrupted at the moment, we haven't been able to predict anything correctly for ages, right? So, um, uh, so I'm very wary of, it's like, it's like predicting the weather more than, you know, 10 days out. It, it just sort of breaks down. And we are in this moment of disruption and dislocation, you know, um, and Brexit is driving that. So all, all, all I can say is that things are going to get kind of a bit more dramatic before October. Probably have time for one more quick question. Uh, terrific presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, two questions. I'll be quick. The, why you say Britain made the EU worse? What, why, how did the Britain make the EU worse? And also all these trade agreements... It may be an oversimplified question, but all these free trade agreements, EU or Britain, why do we have to pick? Why don't we just have a free trade world? Why is, why is there um, only free trade agreements between particular countries? All right. Why, well, the what, whole key of globalisation is we all uh, have, you know, yeah. encourage free trade. Sure. Um, I, I'll, I'll answer the second one because I'm not, I'm not sure that that's the message I meant to convey that, that it made it, it worse. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go on to the free trade. The, the question about free trade agreements is, are they a good idea? Um, and, you know, are they political rather than economic? You know, the, the, the reasons that people initiate them are, are, well, I mean, I suppose I'm speaking from my profession here, uh, my discipline here is, is, is political. Um, and uh, so, you know, why don't we, let's just focus on why don't we have one with Britain and Australia in, uh, and, and the EU? Probably we eventually will. But there are only a certain member, number of people who work in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and they only have a certain amount of time to devote to this. So, you, so a lot of politics is about where you set your priorities. It's a question of... Well, I mean, I mean, even if we... But, but is it? I mean, that, I mean th that's the political question that has opened up. And it's, you know, there's a critique on the left, and now the unusual thing is it's coming from the, from the right as well, is that, that possibly it's not a good idea, that maybe it makes, uh, provides people with a lot of um, uh, low-quality part-time jobs uh, and, and actually kind of uh, um, makes people relatively poorer uh, and, and political resentment builds up thereby, and that maybe free, free trade is, is not the, the panacea that um, its adherents think it is.